So I'm going to now take you through a little bit more detail about our all flash array and something that really Thanks. ties it into our portfolio called the unified flash fabric. Thank you. And this slide you just saw, so I will move forward. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about predictive flash for a moment. So February 23rd, we announced our all flash array, and we also announced what we call our predictive flash platform. <laughs> the predictive flash platform is made up of two components. It's made up of InfoSight, our predictive analytics, and what we call the unified flash fabric. You're going to hear a lot about InfoSight in the second half of this um, presentation, so I'll, I'll skip that in its entirety, and I'll talk in a moment about unified flash fabric. The real benefits come down to the whole platform being smart and fast, and you'll see exactly what that means. But we deliver that at a fundamentally lower TCO than the competition, meaning the other all flash arrays out there, because of some fundamental architectural um, design points that we've built into the, into the system. I'll go through all of that. So the unified flash fabric, what is it? We have a brand new all flash array, 100%, Flash, its design center is absolute performance and very, very low latency. We also have our existing hybrid platform that we call the Adaptive Flash platform. Now this platform is variable in that we can vary all the resources dynamically to provide this sort of sweet spot of price, performance and capacity in a completely flexible way that suits many applications. Both platforms run the same version of Nimble OS, and they share the same data services. And this gives it some really interesting properties. So let me show you the unified flash fabric. In this example, we have a scalar cluster. There are four arrays. There's one pool of adaptive flash, so hybrid, and one pool of all flash. Now what we can do, so it's all managed as a single entity, we can click a button, and we can place our applications on the type of storage that makes most sense at that time. And then, as service levels change or as needs change, we can dynamically, without any interruption to production, we can move applications from one form of storage to another. Okay? Now, perhaps an even more important characteristic of this is think about backup, DR, and archival. Now, very clearly, the world is moving towards primary workloads on all flash, okay? However, when it comes to backup DR and archival, it doesn't always make sense to put them on all flash. So we have this really interesting capability. We can replicate, of course, to another all flash array, but we can also replicate to a cost-optimized adaptive configuration at a fraction of the cost without really giving up anything. And I'll talk about that a bit more later. But this is what we mean by a unified flash fabric. Okay, so let me now talk a little bit more specifically about the all flash array, the array that you can see over there. Just to give you some context, we, the design center here was that we really wanted to build something that was significantly better than an already crowded field of, of fairly formidable all fla flash array competitors out there. We wanted to do something that was materially better. We announced it on February the 23rd. We began shipping it in the middle of March. So we had half a quarter, half a nimble quarter, um, in which to ship. And we've just, on Wednesday of this week, we announced the results for our Q1. And they're pretty stellar, considering we just had half a quarter of shipping a brand new platform for us. We had 55 customers buying all flash arrays, some multiple. That's the first statistic. I think what surprised the analysts that were watching our results was about half of them are new customers. So it's always easier for a company to sell to existing happy customers. About half of them were new customers. And in almost every case, these were highly competitive deals against the best of the best old flash array competitors. The second data point was 12% of our array revenue came from all flash array in just the first half quarter of shipping. And 64% of them, both in new and existing customers, were what we call unified deployments. In other words, validating that whole unified flash fabric design where customers either chose to split their production so that some latency sensitive applications were on all flash and others were on adaptive, our hybrid platform, or they bought all flash for production and they bought adaptive for DR at about a third of the cost. 
Okay, so that's the, the stats so far. You'll hear an update as we go, you know, in about three months' time as we end our Q2 for this year. But let me tell you a little bit more around the key points of our all flash array. And I'll start with this idea, the crude one, performance and scalability. So let me go through that. So we can take a single all flash array and we can scale it up. So we can non-disruptively grow its capacity footprint by adding shelves of SSDs. Okay, so that grows the capacity. And then we can non-disruptively upgrade the performance by replacing so those hot pluggable controllers that you saw earlier Tom pulling out. You can pull one out of one model, put in one of a faster model, and you just non-disruptively scale that performance. Okay? And then we can scale out. So we can non-disruptively linearly grow both capacity and performance by adding additional arrays. So how far do we take that? And the answer is very far. So this shows a single array in the nimble case and then a scale out cluster. So in a single array, we can grow our effective capacity footprint in just 12 U to two petabytes of effective capacity, okay? Running at about 300,000 IOPS at a mix of reads and writes. In a cluster, four times that, over eight petabytes at 1.2 million IOPS. If we look at Extreme IO, who is the market leader in all flash arrays, their single array, they call it an X brick. The maximum capacity is about a tenth of what we can do in a single footprint and their performance about half of ours. And then in an eight X brick cluster, again, less capacity than we can do in just a single array at 12 U. Pure storage, interesting there. Their maximum configuration of their highest end system is about a fifth of ours in terms of capacity. Okay, so we've taken performance and capacity scalability to another level. And of course, there is no scale out in that architecture. So let me now go through some of the TCO aspects. And I talk about this from the point of view of we've really built this to take advantage of the current state of technology. And if you think about it... Hey, Gavin, is that uh, raw capacity comparisons or is that effective capacity? Those are effective at the published specs and dedupe and compression rates that everyone puts on their website. So I've tried, we've tried to pull as, you know, as good as it gets from every vendor. So we're, that's, that's how we've calculated. If you went back down to raw, you'd see a very similar kind of ratio. The, the graph sizes would say, stay about the same. Okay. So let me talk about TCO, and I'll talk about from the perspective of architectural advantages that we've built into the platform. So the first one, and I'll run through it, is this idea that we're not constrained by memory. What do I mean by that? In order to build an all flash array with deduplication and keeping all your hash signatures in memory so you can have very fast lookups and track and manage snapshots and clones and replication relationships and pointers of every block of data to mapping to the SSDs, you need a lot of processing power and you need a lot of memory. Given the density of flash, the size of flash, and the need for bigger and bigger flash arrays, we really pay, paid close attention in our architecture to being as memory efficient as possible. So we are 10 to 30 times more memory efficient, meaning we need 10 to 30 times less memory for a given amount of raw flash than any other all flash vendor. So how, what does this mean? This means we drive down the cost of the array itself, okay? It next means we can scale further. That's very much why you saw the chromatic difference in that earlier slide. We're simply not constrained by memory when it comes to capacity scalability. And finally, as you scale out into even bigger pools of storage, we need less hardware overall. The next area is the NAND itself, or the SSDs themselves. We've picked the current best generation of 3D TLC NAND. We use the Samsung SSDs. In order to do that, we've built our own SSD endurance management software. Okay? We do it in a way where we, we warrant the drives for a seven-year <coughs> lifespan. Okay? However, we've built an enormous number of efficiencies into that. So we, just like in our hybrid array, we leverage this property where we coalesce thousands or tens of thousands of small random blocks 
into large stripes that we can write to SSD in a very SSD friendly way. That helps with endurance and it helps with performance to SSDs. And finally, with our triple parity RAID and our guaranteed space for hot spare, we still get 20% more net usable capacity than the nearest competitor that also uses this type of 3D NAND. Okay, so that's a direct 20% benefit on top of all the other benefits we have with things like triple parity RAID and integrated sparing. So that's the type of flash we use. Now if you take those first two aspects that I've just talked about, the memory efficiency and the type of flash we use, it paints a very dramatic picture. Okay? This is what it takes to get to that two petabyte footprint that I referenced earlier. So in Nimble's case, and you see one over there, it's a single AF9000 with two capacity shelves, each of 4U. In Pure Storage's case, it's five independent, they don't cluster, their largest arrays with 20 shelves, and this is all to scale. EMC needs a full cluster of 8x bricks and another half cluster. And the last one there is Solidfire, okay, with 82 nodes to get to the same capacity point. So that's just how those first two play out if you take it at a configuration here we've picked two petabytes. So let me move on. As you all know in this room, data reduction is an absolute must when it comes to all flash arrays. We have deep expertise in data reduction. Our founders, one of them was the core <coughs> architect of Data Domain that built the, the CISL single, single instancing file system that Data Domain is still famous for. We developed an inline global big mouthful variable block dedupe and compression that achieves absolutely fantastic dedupe and data reduction rates, okay? We have other techniques like what we call zero block elimination and then of course things like zero copy clones <coughs> and all the other services like thin provisioning so that the net net is really, really stellar data reduction, a must have in the all flash space. And finally, when it comes to cost reduction, and I mentioned this earlier, is this you know, idea hey, of... Hey, Gavin, with the yes. same sorts of deduplication and compression, how do you get by with less memory? So, <laughs> there's a, I'll, I'll give you the quick answer. It's really how we store our hashes in memory. Um, we have a, essentially a, a two-stage hash that allows us to keep the entire signature pool in memory without needing as much as the other guys, and really just a clever architecture. So we paid a lot of attention to this, and, and if I, I just paint some context, just five years ago when most of the other all flash arrays were being designed, SSDs were very small, and SSD capacities and arrays weren't that big at all. In today's world, where we wanted to pack two petabytes into a small footprint, we simply paid much more attention in our architecture to what we needed to do on the memory sort of management side of things. So it's just purely a, an architectural design. And I'll say it that we, we do it without any kind of performance trade-off, okay? So this last point, so backup DR and archival, and I mentioned this earlier, we've got this great attribute that you can put your production data on all flash, but you can very cost effectively replicate to a cost optimized adaptive flash configuration at about a third of the cost. And you don't give up anything. On the primary site, you can keep instant online application consistent snapshots for instant backup and recovery. And then we have very granular replication to a remote site and that remote site can have our adaptive flash platform where you get near flash-like performance, same features and functions, but you can keep a much longer history at a much more cost-effective price for backup DR and archival. And that's proving to be a very popular configuration just in our first six weeks of shipping the all flash array. So that's is that, the- is that, is that synchronous replication then? That's asynchronous replication. Okay. And it's um, a five minute RPO. Five minutes, so we can do it at five minute granularity or up to five minutes. And we also support tens of thousands of snapshots and, and, and replicants, so you can keep a very, very rich history of these things on both the primary and the secondary site. And it's application consistent? A application consistent, correct. So we have all the frameworks in place for some of the major applications. 
Okay, so the third area, and I touched on some of this earlier, but I'll just give you some highlights again. So we talk about absolute resiliency. So this magic number of our measured availability across our entire install base, so five nines and a seven. Triple plus parity, I mentioned earlier, three entire simultaneous disk failures, as well as every other SSD can have sector failures, and we can still keep running without any loss of data, any loss of service. And then what I just mentioned, integrated data protection. So application consistent thousands or tens of thousands of snapshots with replication. We call that smart snap and smart replicate. We also have fairly sophisticated integration with some of the major backup vendors like Commvault, Symantec, and Veeam just announced that they will support our snapshots and replication in their frameworks. So very rich third-party backup support as well. And the last one that I'll touch on is an interesting one, which is encryption. Now, the easy thing to do when you build an array, and what most of our competitors have done, is you leverage either the disk drives or the SSDs themselves to do the encryption. So that's called FDE, full disk encryption. The benefit of that is it's easy, right? The negative is it's on or off in the entire system. And the reason is, you spread the data across multiple SSDs, right? We chose not to do that because we wanted to build a granular approach. So we use the offload on the Intel CPUs to do our encryption, and we can turn it on or off by data set, meaning we can encrypt or shred one data set at a time. It has a second really important advantage, which is when we replicate from one system to another, we can actually preserve the encryption relationship. In the case of using a full disk encryption, when you replicate, you actually have to read the data and decrypt it, and then send it across and re-encrypt it at the other side. So that's become a really key differentiator for us in some of the more data-sensitive environments. Where are you keeping the keys for the encryption? So we keep them, they're, they're all kept on the, the controllers, um, encrypted themselves. You transfer the keys to the other when you to the other yeah. array that's the target. Correct. In, all the payload encrypted. Yep. So everything's encrypted, and it's only the the user that gets to to decrypt. 